Welcome to our session on OpenET. I'm delighted to have you here. Uh, OpenET is a web accessible platform that puts satellite based data on evapotranspiration in the hands of everyone to advance collaboration and climate resilience. My name is Maurice Hall, and I lead Environmental Defense Fund's Climate Resilient Water Systems Program. Um, and Environmental Defense Fund is an environmental nonprofit that works in 28 countries and has more than 3 million members. Now, this is my first time at World Water Week. And in fact, it's the first time for all the participants in our panel here today. We're really excited to be here in Stockholm to share with you uh, Open ET, something that we've been uh, putting a lot of work into for the last six years. Now, this is especially exciting for me uh, as a water resource engineer for the past 30 years, practically every problem that I've dealt with, I've run into the need for good information about evapotranspiration, one of the largest components of the water budget in most places. And frankly, in many cases, we had to guess. Sometimes we got information, but it was very expensive. But now, because of the work of this team and a, and a, a number of people behind them, OpenET is providing that data day in and day out for 17 Western states and the United States. OpenET is up and running. And we have a, a number of end users on our, that, on our panel today that will share with you how they are using the data. But before we get to those end users, we want to provide you with a brief introduction of OpenET and show you how it works. So I want to introduce to you Robin Grimm, who is leading the new OpenET organization. And she will be followed by Gabriel Sene from the US Geological Survey, one of the leading experts in satellite-based ET measurement uh, to tell you more. Okay, hopefully this is working, yeah? Okay, thank you, Maurice, and hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for spending some time with us this morning. Really excited to have you here and to have this amazing panel to talk a little bit more with us today about how they're using OpenET. Um, it's probably no secret to any of you in this room that the world in general is facing increasing, increasing challenges around drought and scarcity. Um, I'm from California. We're all from the US on this panel in this room, where most of us are. And according to the United States Drought Monitor, nearly 50% of the contiguous United States is currently facing drought and scarcity. Um, and unfortunately, as shown in this map here, the United States is hardly alone. Many parts of the world are facing scarcity for at least 10 months out of the year. And it's anticipated that half the world's population could actually be living in areas facing scarcity by 2025. And as drought becomes more common, farmers and water managers are having to figure out how to sustain communities sustain ecosystems and continue to grow the food that we all eat with just a fraction of the water that was available before. Now imagine trying to manage a resource as precisely and carefully as we need to without, as Maurice alluded to, consistent and timely data on the amount of water that crops and other vegetation actually consume and use as they grow. It's somewhat surprising that that's actually been the case across the globe uh, for many years now. So today we're going to talk about OpenET and how it came, it was developed and came in and is helping to start to fill this huge data gap for water management starting in the Western US. OpenET is an online weighted water data platform that provides field scale evapotranspiration data across 17 states in the Western US. You're going to see a little demo of the platform in a little while, but I first wanna talk a little bit more about what evapotranspiration is and why it matters. The ET in OpenET stands for evapotranspiration, and that's the process by which water evaporates from the land surface and transpires from plants. It's the first and second bullets there on the slide in front of you. ET represents the second largest component of the water cycle, and it can be thought of as the opposite of precipitation, right? It's water that's leaving the land surface and returning back up to the atmosphere. And as such, it's a measure of the portion of the water that once applied to the landscape is no longer available for reuse. It's also a key measure for farmers of the amount of water that needs to be replaced through irrigation or precipitation in order to ensure a healthy crop with maximum yields. 
we like to say managing water without understanding ET then is kind of like trying to manage a household budget without really knowing how much you're spending day in and day out. OpenET has made this critical water consumption data widely available down to the field scale. This opens the door to many new water management strategies that just wouldn't otherwise be possible at that kind of scale. OpenET can help rural communities design locally driven water conservation and trading programs. Water managers can use OpenET to develop more accurate water budgets and incentive programs. OpenET can also be used by policymakers to more accurately track water supplies at larger scales, simplify regulatory compliance, and co-develop solutions with local communities that are based on a common starting understanding of water use on the ground. And finally, farmers can use OpenET data to improve irrigation practices and reduce costs for fertilizer, water, and energy. We're so lucky to be joined by a lot of the users of OpenET today that can talk more about all of these uses of the platform. Um, but first, we're going to be talking a little bit more about how this works and again, showing that demo. So I'm very pleased now to introduce Gabriel Sine, uh, a research scientist and OpenET partner from the US Geological Survey to explain a little bit more about how OpenET actually works. Thank you, Robin. What you've seen here is the public-private uh, partnerships, which is very key for the success of OpenET. Um, there is uh, three federal agencies, as you can see, NASA, USDA, and USGS, working with several universities and private partners. That's what makes it a successful partnership. This group, they're behind, in each of them, probably one or two or three members. So you can imagine how many people are participating. They work as one unit. And they share ideas, they share technology, skills, and to uh, produce a very useful and accurate product. Next, please. And here, uh, before we do a demo, I just want to explain how we estimate ET from space. There are two panels in here. On the left side, you see satellite data. So you need data source from satellite. On the right side, these kids playing with sprinklers, actually, they're using practical knowledge of heat transfer and evaporative cooling. So how about when you don't have that feeling? Well, we have equations. So science engineers have developed energy balance equations that turn these feelings into estimation of evapotranspiration. So satellites provide that data. In what way? Well, they give you how green the vegetation is, so which means use more water, or how the land surface is cool or dry. So the difference in temperature is huge. When it's very dry, the temperature could be as high as 25 degrees centigrade or 45 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than a well-watered pool surface, which is evapotranspired to the maximum. So that's really the key. You need satellite data, combined with some weather data, and a physics energy balance systems. Next, please. So how good is our product? Well, we have to validate the product using independent data. You can always create impressive satellite images, but you still have to ground truth and validate. So OpenET took a lot of energy and resources to um, test, evaluate probably the largest ever intercomparative model intercomparative work, six models using more than 140 stations called flux towers, eddy covariance data, very expensive. And the results have been very good and published in the Journal of the American Water Resources Association. So before, I guess before uh, then, it's time for a demo. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, my colleague, Alberto uh, Guzman, who is a senior software engineer at NASA and from California State, uh, Monterey Bay, who helped build OpenET and will give you a brief demo, Alberto. Thank you, Gabriel. So I'm gonna start out at the OpenET page. As you can see here, if you look at the top right corner, we don't we have a lot of methodologies, a lot of explanations on how the models work. But the thing I'm going to focus on is the data explorer. So if you go to the data explorer button and you click it, first you'll be greeted by a page where you can create your free OpenET account. After you create your account, you'll be able to sign into the map. You can see that the map has a lot of layers and controls for the data. 
I'm going to start at the top. So if you look at the top, you have your, your year selection, your variable selection. There you go. <laughs> and your view selector. No? Does that work? All right, the light wasn't good for me, so. <laughs> um, then if we move down to the map, you have your, where you can toggle the units and the opacity of the layers and where you can zoom in and out. Okay, so I'm gonna use the view toggle to change from the field boundaries to the gridded data. And then I'm gonna change the year from 2022 to 2017. And as you can see, I'm gonna to toggle back and forth. You can see that the spatial patterns change. So now that we got a, a, a look of the high level overview of the map, I'm gonna zoom into an area in Northern Colorado and go back to the field view. So as OpenET has 4.4 million polygons with pre-computed data. And I'm gonna show you how they line up with the base layer of the Google Maps, the imagery. As you can see that, that's... If you go to any of those fields, if you hover over it, you're gonna see on uh, the top right corner, a time series of that data. If you click the field, you're gonna get a time series of the last five years of data. If you look at the, at the right side, you can select any of the six open ET models plus the ensemble average and the range. If you look at uh, 2017, it looks different than other years. This is because this particular field uh, participated in a volunteer program to follow their, their land for that year, 2017 through early 2018. Before this would have taken a long time, but because we have OpenET and we could compare the different models, you can clearly see it here. We have the monthly data, but also we have cumulative option where it's even easier to see that 2017, that year was different. So now we go back to the raster view where you can see the gridded data and see how the ET data plays out over the landscape. Here you can also click on, on any point to get a time series like before, but this uh, with the pixel level, you get more options, you get daily data like so. Another thing, if, let's say you didn't want just a pixel, or you didn't want a predefined field that you wanted to create your own shape. So if you go to the bottom right corner, you have the draw custom area button. If we click that, you're taken to, a, to some tools that we have to create your own field. So the top right corner has where either you can create a box or specify the vertices of your polygon. So that's what I did here. And then if I, if I, when I complete that polygon, I get an, uh, after a few seconds, I get a time series of the shape that I specify. So you might be wondering, uh, can I get access to the back end, to the tools that were used to create this amazing website? The answer is yes. So later in the year, we're gonna be releasing a public API or applications. So yeah, there are more tools that the API is gonna provide. So if you have any questions, just let me know. I'm gonna hand it back to Maurice so he can introduce the panel. Now, Alberto and, and Gabriel are part of a team of more than 30 people who have built this platform. Just as important are the users. And so we do have a panel 
of users who uh, you can come up and take your seat, um, who are going to share with you how, how they are using OpenET data. Here, Mark, I think you're first. have a chance to answer some questions. So um, joining us today are a number, of, a number of users that I mentioned. And at first, I think we're going to start with Mark Owens. Mark is an alfalfa farmer in the US state of Oregon. And he's also serving his first term as an elected representative in the Oregon state legislature. And Mark, we thought we should start with you because as a farmer, you're experiencing the effects firsthand of water scarcity in Eastern Oregon. And as an elected official, you're representing farmers too. Can you tell us a little of your personal experience using OpenET and, uh, and how you've used it to reduce applied water and how it's informing your work on the farm and then more regionally, uh, even uh, this, your statewide scale as a politician? Oh, yes. Stand by for a commercial, please. We, we have a video that shows you first a little closer hand uh, where Mark is coming from in eastern Oregon. We're under a drought in most of the West contiguously. The climate is changing. Summers are getting longer. It's getting hotter. It's getting drier. We're getting less precipitation. So I think there's a growing awareness in all of the West that we have to use significantly less water. So agriculture has to figure out how to get as much per drop of water as they can. I started to try to understand evapotranspiration when we collectively started trying to figure out, can I put less water on my fields and still yield the same amount or more? I go online and I can pull up the evapotranspiration numbers. I compare the amount of water that I apply daily, weekly, probably monthly, compared to what OpenET says, and I can see if I'm over applying or under applying. So if I put on more water than evapotranspiration I already have in my bank, I can shut off for a couple of days. That means we could use about 25% less water and still produce the same amount of crop, which means a lot if you're putting out several million gallons of water a day. Go for it, Mark. I'm going to stand a little bit just because I feel better. So, uh, good morning. Welcome to Stockholm. I hope your journey was good. Ours was a little interesting. At 1.30 this morning, I wasn't sure if we were going to be here. I'm not sure why Maurice would want to start with a politician because I'm supposed to limit myself to five minutes. But that being said, I must start with my adventure or journey into water and how I became a farmer that used OpenET and a policymaker that wants to support it. So in May 2026, the Water Resource Department of Oregon came into my basin in Southeast Oregon. Said, hey, we might have made a mistake. We might have overappropriated your basin. They showed us a blue bar graph. On that blue bar graph, it showed from 1968 Robinson study, the amount of recharge that comes into our basin, about 270,000 acre feet. Of that, about 89,200 acre feet are used for springs and streams, leaving a remainder for approximately 170,000 acre feet. They had appropriated at that time around 270,000 acre feet. So I asked myself why it frustrated me, made me concerned, how could this happen? It must be a one-off. Must have only happened in the Harney Basin in Southeast Oregon. These were rural, only have a couple thousand people. They weren't paying attention. The more I looked, the more I realized, hey, that's not true. It happened in Oregon before, continued to happen in Oregon, sapping across the rest of the 17 Western states, and probably in a community or basin or region of yours. So that started, I guess, a progression in my life. I was a first generation farmer. I never left the farm, but I actually got kind of pissed off. What can we do about this? So it took myself and manifested itself in two different directions. How can we stop this from happening at the state level? And how can we work with communities like myself and mine to figure out how we can get sustainable? So my goal right now is to make sure every basin in Oregon can understand their water balance overlaid with what's been appropriated. The biggest data gap that we found was actually consumptive use. 
not going off paper water because we all know that's just as good as the paper it's written on. What is actually being used? And that's where Open ET comes in. Open ET can help create those water balances and budgets in real time. In Oregon, water is a public resource managed by the state. But if it's a public resource, shouldn't the public know how we're using that water, what we're applying? I say yes. So in 2021, as the state representative, we took forward a package that I championed in order to make the Water Resource Department in the state of Oregon team up with USGS and come up with those water balances and those water budgets. And actually show with OpenET historical record of what has been used and what is currently being used. So the public can understand that water balance and budget and so can the agriculture community. So we can start to figure out how we can manage the water better. So that'll be the first, we're just actually starting that. They started sending the contract to USGS and we're gonna start working through that. So that's a good thing. So that's how we'll figure out how we can stop the lack of a better term, the blood flow. These people know that we are bleeding out in the 17 Western states and that blood is water. Now, personally, what does that mean to my community? What does that to mean to me as a farmer? So also in 2015, we started a water collaborative. As the state said they would start to do a more comprehensive groundwater study, we started discussing because it was clear and evident that we had to use less water and we were overappropriated. What can we do about that? So we started working with many host of solutions on how we can use less water as an agricultural community. And a lot of those are going to rely on open evapotranspiration. One of them will be a water market share, a declining share program that we start out with a basis and we start reducing as we go through a period of time. There's a lot of water regulation and policy in Oregon, but there's not a lot of accountability or tools in order for the public to understand. So as an agriculture community, when I come forward and I ask for flexibility and how to use water, there should be an expectation that will also be transparent that we're meeting those needs, the desires, and actually reducing what we're due. That's where Open ET comes in. So Open ET can look at my farms, my fields, and if I say I'm going to use 3% less water that year on a declining share, everybody should be able to know. They should be able to look back on a period of record and say, hey, he's meeting his goal. So it's gonna be very important in a water market. Also, we're looking at a conservation reserve enhancement program for groundwater. There's been a couple successful in the Western states, one in Colorado or two in Colorado and others. So if we're gonna use public money to dry up water, a match between federal and state, once again, we gotta be transparent. We gotta make sure that if we're doing a water market or a CREP program, excuse me, that we're actually drying the water up. How can we do that now? We can do that with open ET. So if we're using a public resource, the public should have the ability to see the information of the water that's not being applied. So it'd be a voluntary cancellation of a water rate. What does it mean to my own water management on my own farm? So the groundwater study that I talked about just got published in April of this year, and it shows that in our basin, there were about 110,000 acre feet over appropriated. We only use about 135 to 145,000 acre feet of groundwater in the basin. It's a closed basin. There's no access to any rivers. We're in the dry part of Southeast Oregon, eight to 10 inches of rainfall, 4,200 foot. There's no Columbia River that we're gonna tap into. There's no dam that we're going to put in. Not saying that we should, but we're gonna to have to figure out how to become sustainable. So with evapotranspiration, we've designed sprinkler system using low elevation spray applications where we reduced our water use by 20%. We've reduced our power use by 25%. We started to figure out how to do more with less. Conservation through efficiencies without reduction of yield. That's the first step. We work with the agricultural community to design systems to match the water that we need. So every Monday I get, get, get together with my seven and nine employees. We have two people that are in charge of irrigation. We do about 4,000 acres. We actually look at open ET. We look at the they have a draft or a beta that actually will forecast open ET for the next seven days in my area. So we look at what the water crop demand is going to be. We know what we're applying and we talk. How many days can we irrigate this week? How many days should we irrigate this week? And we'll actually shut down for one or two days because most of the time an irrigation system is designed for peak, evap peak evapotranspiration in the summer. So the areas where you can really start to reduce is during crop scheduling or when it's cooler in the spring and fall. So we go through that exercise every Monday to figure out how we're gonna use less water. We start talking about different crops, different things. So it's an evolving education process in our community and how we do it. So I represent farmers and ranchers. 
I represent 37% of the southeast corner of the state. It's mostly ag. This does make ag nervous, folks. It does. But you have to have some grace with our agriculture community to work through this. We need to make sure that we ground truth it with more eddy covariance stations. We got to make sure there's a common understanding that the information here is accurate. I'm there. One of those flux towers was in one of, one of my alfalfa pivots. But some of my other agricultural people across the western states, it's not there. But I'll also share with you, I believe the vast majority, way up in the upper 90s of farmers and ranchers use water within their rate and duty. They do. And I tell them, if you do that, let's show that to the public. Let's make sure people understand that open ET can do, do that. I say, if you're not, stop. We're not going to have any tolerance for those that are using more than what they have. In reality is we're going to have to use less. I probably spoke for over my five minutes, so I'm going to hand it back over to Maurice. Thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate your leadership and the picture that you painted is a picture that we see time and time and time again across the Western US and I'm sure in many other parts of the world. Uh, we want to go next to, a, to a, uh, another farmer, uh, Brett Baker. Brett is from California's Sacramento San Joaquin Delta. Uh, that Delta is a critical hub for California's water infrastructure. It's also a vibrant farming region and a vital ecosystem. Now, like other irrigators in the region, Brett, you have to report your water use. Uh, and as an attorney, you also help other farmers and water districts in that process. Could you give us an idea of the status of farmers using open ET to report their water use to the state of California and how farmers are reacting to this new compliance system uh, that uses open ET? Oh, after the video. <laughs> Is this thing on? Is this on? Yeah. We have been farming on this piece of dirt since the 1850s, and we are proud stewards of this land. As a farmer by nature, you're an environmentalist. Your well-being is tied to the well-being of the, the plants and wildlife that depend on the same resources that you do. The Delta is 750,000 acres, roughly the size of the state of Rhode Island, the largest estuary on the west coast of the North and South Hemisphere. The last major drought, it became abundantly clear that we didn't have sufficient data to make critical decisions about how to manage in shortage circumstances. Measuring water in the Delta has been a fool's errand. Measuring just the applied water or diverted water doesn't give you the full picture. Instead of putting a meter on every diversion, it just made sense to look at something that was less invasive, less expensive. So open ET is a game changer for the Delta because it will give us real time information that has a high degree of credibility Open ET it gives us a bird's eye view of what's actually going on on the ground in real time. It provides an opportunity to get more relevant data. There will be ways to use this information going forward that will benefit everybody, not just in the state of California, but I believe throughout the Western United States and beyond. Excellent. So I'm that fool. And that's been my errand for the last decade or so. Uh, first, before we get to that, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, where I come from and why our hydrology and our situation makes for a perfect marriage between open ET and, and Delta water users. So the 750,000 acres Michael George, our Delta water master was talking about is a statutorily defined region in the state of California, the Sacramento River Delta. and um, I didn't convert that to hectares, it's about a thousand square miles. And um, the majority of that is our islands and tracks. And they were reclaimed about the time, Calif began being reclaimed about the time California began statehood and the middle of the 1800s and were largely reclaimed by about 1900. 
And one of the unique things about our situation as uh, juxtaposed to the rest of our state is our problem isn't water scarcity so much as we generally have too much water. And so we have artificially created drainage systems in our islands and we discharge water out into the back into the channel to keep our root zone oxygenated and have uh, opportunity to make productive agriculture or cultivate that land. <clears throat> it was generally speaking in a state of nature, a fresh, fresh water tidal estuary marsh, whatever you, word you prefer. Um, and so in our situation, we don't, we cannot store water. We can't, we, we have to get rid of water continually. Our two biggest concerns are floods and then the rest of the state is concerned about drought in California. So we are continually discharging water back into the channel. When we apply water, it is either percolated in, back into the groundwater, evaporated by the plant uh, or discharged back into the channel. So it just makes sense that open ET uh, and, and, and the relevant measure for our water use in the Delta is consumptive use um, for those reasons. And so in about 2009, we passed a piece of legislation in the state of California called the Delta Reform Act, which required for the first time that Delta water users meter or report their water use. So we did this using an equation and localized weather data. We put in some weather stations and we began reporting our water use based on calculation. And Throughout that period of time, uh, I would continually, um, you know, find myself at my wits end. We we installed some water meters, some physical measuring devices, which are extremely costly, difficult to maintain, and worst of all, they give you bad data and they lose a lot of data. So, I would constantly find myself on the side of the levee, replacing a battery or getting a sensor to work, and looking up and saying, "Someone help me, please." And in about 2019, OpenET showed up and Michael George introduced us and we started talking about developing and using the program to report and measure water use in the Delta. And so we have embarked on an effort to build uh, an API, we built an app for that basically, right? So we've used ArcGIS, mapped out our places of use, corresponded to a water right, a point of diversion and identifier. And so our app will take that spatial data, query open ET, get the data back for us, and we'll have an auto populator filled out report. So we can get this data back to the regulators and the water system managers in our state. Um, one other thing about the Delta that I should have mentioned at the very beginning is <clears throat> there are two large diversions in our Delta. The two largest diversions are the state and Central Valley water projects. We have the federal government and the state government both taking water out of the Delta and they rely on, as I said, consumptive use. They've used a model that they created in the 50s and 60s when they start, when the projects came online to calculate Delta consumptive use, net Delta outflow index or in net Delta island consumptive use. And uh, that, mo that algorithm has remained largely unchanged since the 50s and 60s. It has been updated there are a few um, improvements that have been made, but uh, by and large, it's pretty rudimentary. And just for example, if we have measured rainfall at Fire Station 4 in Stockton, we consider that uh, it rained in the entire Delta and uh, that will uh, cancel out the consumptive use for four days thereafter. Any measurable rainfall. So anyhow, uh, it's not a very good equation. So we're, we're excited about this opportunity. Um, it does present us uh, an ability to give uniform data to the, the regulators and, and, and folks operating the system and more timely data. And I think that those two things coupled um, make that uh, increase the value of the utility of that data extremely. Because currently we were looking at water under the bridge. We were reporting last year's data uh, at best. So we've had some legislative changes. We're gonna change our reporting period from an annual year to our water year, which is September 30th to October 1st every year, and we're going to be able to give more timely relevant data to the folks making decisions on how that system's operated. And I'm hopeful that that will not only allow for the continued productivity of my region and my water users and my clients and my family's farm, but also uh, improve the health of the ecosystem and 
allow for better management of the system overall because we'll have more informed decisions. So um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Brett. It's been a real treat to work with you and the other Delta Water Agencies and to, it's great to hear the story from your side of, from your side of the platform. To have you all here, I just want to thank you all for uh, the opportunity to speak with you, and it's a it's a real honor to be here. And um, yeah, I fellow water warriors, I really appreciate that that opportunity. I want to take the moment to say that. Thank you, Aaron. Another place that Open ET is being used is in the high elevation valleys of the U.S. state of Colorado. It's a very different setting from Colorado's from California's Delta region. And we would like to show you a video of a, of a rancher from, from Colorado. My name is Paul Bruchet. I'm a rancher just outside of Kremlin, Colorado. We run a cow-calf operation, raise hay, irrigate out of three different water resources. We also operate a guided fly fishing business to help supplement income and work the ranch as a family. Water to our operation means everything. We rolled through the drought of the early 2000s and the headwaters, learned some lessons there, which is largely why my family and my neighbors are as engaged as we are with water. We are truth testing different forms of measuring water used for irrigation on high altitude perennials. We are studying the recovery of those crops um, after having different forms of treatment to them, the full season curtailment and then a split season where the producer was allowed to irrigate until June 15th and then required to shut off for the remainder of the season. I'm excited to continue to learn about the information and data gathered by OpenET. I'm excited to truth test that against many of the other forms and mechanisms that we have working. With OpenET, it completely changes our ability to understand what's going on within our fields. Water is the lifeblood of the West and we have to figure out how to do more or the same with less the more that we have the science and the data, uh, the more that we'll be able to make good decisions. Now with us today, we have Aaron Derwinson, who is a water project manager for the Nature Conservancy. And he's been working with Paul Bruchet, who you saw in the video, and a number of other ranchers in Colorado. Now, Aaron, you've been working with these ranchers and, uh, and the university partners to determine how ranchers in Colorado can conserve water while minimizing impacts on their pastures health and their long-term yield and economic survival. Could you tell us a little bit about this study to incorporate uh, that's, and why it's important to Colorado and beyond and why, how Open ET is helping? Yeah, thanks Maurice. And <clears throat> thanks everybody for being here and for the opportunity to share our story. And uh, Paul couldn't be here, but he sends his greetings and uh, y'all are stuck with me, but um, uh, I, I think in terms of the, the importance, you know, water scarcity is a huge issue for Colorado. It's a huge issue for the other six states and the country of Mexico that share in the resource. Uh, 40 million people, some 5 million acres of irrigated ag land, and then a vast and interconnected ecosystem, all at incredible risk right now because the Colorado River is tanking. Uh, if you haven't seen the news in the last week, really, uh, it's in a very... <laughs> very precipitous place. Flows have dropped some 20% uh, since 2000, and they're forecasted to, de to decline another 10 to 40% by 2050. The reservoirs in the basin um, have plummeted to dangerously low levels. They're as, as low as they've ever been since they were first being filled. Uh, and the uh, recent estimate is that they need to cut back two to four million acre feet in the basin just to stabilize the system where it's at now. Uh, I think this is a savvy crowd, right? So an acre foot is about how much water you need for two average households for a year. Uh, cutting back two to four million acre feet in the basin is a, is a massive amount of water. The whole basin uses about 12 and a half million acre feet right now. And so it's a, it's a monumental task and it's going to affect everything from food production that, that Paul thinks about to hydropower to water availability to cities to river flows for endangered fish and other wildlife that depend on those riparian ecosystems. And so we've got our uh, work cut out for us. And the work with ag is especially important, right? Ag in the basin, like most 
water scarce regions is the, is the bulk of the water use. It's about 80 to 85 percent of the use in the basin for growing food and fiber. And so any solution is going to significantly involve ag. And that's sort of where the easy part ends, right? And what that solution needs to look like is, is the, the real um, challenge and opportunity that we're facing, right? Again, because it's so interconnected with, uh, with food, with local and regional economies, um, and for us, you know, stream flows and wildlife habitat. And in a place like Colorado, and you know, what you saw where Paul and his neighbor's ranch, you know, wildlife habitat and irrigated ag are, are really intertwined. And so we have to be really thoughtful about what that reduction looks like in ag. And, and that's really the work that, that I do at TNC that we do with Paul and others is to tackle that challenge, right? Build partners with ag water users, with the folks that are managing that resource day in day, and day out and have that knowledge, you know, combine it with resources from universities and other partners and develop, test, and then share these you know, creative water conservation strategies that can help us uh, get by in a water limited system, you know, but do it in a way that allows us to thrive and allows for productive ag and allows for healthy communities and a healthy environment. Uh, and then over the last 10 years, we've been doing dozens of different experiments, small scale, large scale, uh, working with different partners. But the study that Paul mentioned that we're doing with OpenET and others, it's really, I think, probably our most ambitious or certainly our most comprehensive um, effort to date to really think about how do we tackle all of those interrelated issues <clears throat> uh, around reducing ag water use. Um, it's a four-year study. It's set up as a side-by-side -side comparison where we have the treatment fields that Paul mentioned that have some form of reduced irrigation and then reference fields that get you know business as usual. And between the two, we're comparing water use and water savings uh, forage quality, forage quantity, agronomics, wildlife habitat, impact on stream flows, really trying to get that comprehensive picture of what does this mean for each individual parcel, the whole community, and the river itself. Our kind of three main questions are, you know, how can we measure water use accurately and at scale, which is where OpenET comes from or comes in. And then what are the agronomic impacts of reduced water use? And how can we help producers make informed decisions about how to manage this increasingly limited resource? And then for the basin and for the nature conservancy, we want to better understand how does that water conservation impact wildlife habitat and river flows? And really this kind of comprehensive research study, it's, it's only possible thanks to all the partners involved. You know, Paul's really one of the champions of the project, but he's got nine other families that he's recruited to join in this effort. They've put about 1,200 acres of land into the program, allowed researchers from three different universities to crawl all over the field and measure the grass and put equipment in. Um, and then those partners themselves that are doing the research and providing the data. Um, and OpenET is just really a core component of this work to understand water use, right? If we didn't have OpenET and we couldn't create these pictures like this, we'd be left with, left with sort of the traditional options, which rely very heavily on assumptions. If you were going to go through Colorado right now and, and, and estimate water use on these fields, you would basically be, you'd be guessing. You'd be doing informed guessing and well-reasoned guessing, but you'd be guessing. You'd be guessing at how much water they divert. You'd be guessing at what they uh, efficiency is to get it to the field, the efficiency it gets applied with, and you'd be guessing at what the crops use. Okay. And if we wanted an alternative that wasn't open ET, we'd be out there doing a whole water balance, right? We would be putting tons of equipment on these fields all the way down in the soil, measuring all the water applied, where it goes back to the river in 50 different locations. And, and I know a lot of ranchers, but I don't know anyone who wants to sign up for that level of instrumentation on their field, right? And so the ability to have something like OpenET that lets us get those estimates at scale, cost effectively, uh, it, it, it's huge, right? And I think this picture shows um, you know, it shows the results from our fields, right? And shows the water use compared to previous years, right? And so we have the treatment fields that you can see in red. That's where the water use is lower. And you can see the reference field there in blue, right? And so that gives us a very visual piece. But I think the other really important part that we've learned in this project is how this can build trust in the tool from our ag partners, right? Because they can look at that field and they can align what they see with what they know. And, and a quick story you can see on that um, that top treatment one where it says T2, you can see a little bit of blue bleeding into the red, right? And what we happened is that field wasn't supposed to get irrigated. 
but because of changes in management that come along with it, one of the ditches blew out and it spread a bunch of water under the field that wasn't supposed to get it. And you can see that clearly, right? So you can see this was, you know, maybe happened for two, three weeks on there. And, and that lets Paul and his neighbors again see like, well, hey, this is what I know from my management and it aligns with what I'm seeing. And it builds more trust in the tool than, you know, seeing some, you know, different engineering spreadsheets. Uh, I think the last thing I want to say is, is the importance of getting to scale. Because this project matters for this part of the Colorado River. It matters for this community in Kremlin. But if we don't figure out how to tackle this problem at the whole scale of the basin, then uh, that's where we're really, we're really lost and where the real opportunity is, right? And in the basin, we basically have a massive water management challenge, right? And the old saying, you can't manage what you can't measure. And this is going to be, I think, the, one of the most important tools we have to do that measurement at scale that's going to allow for that improved water management. And then success is going to take that tool coming together with folks like Paul and his neighbors, other ag leaders, you know, like Mark, Mark and Brett that are willing to experiment and try something new with public funding, with philanthropy, uh, all that's going to have to come together for um, a path to make change at a scale for places like the Colorado River Basin. Uh, but really excited to share this story because I think this is exactly how we start and uh, where we grow from. Thanks, Maurice. Yeah, Aaron, very glad that you could be here. We're glad to have Paul on the video, but I think the, com the combination uh, of you, the university groups and the farmers is exactly the kind of, uh, illustrates exactly the kind of collaboration that is going to help us address uh, this repeated challenge. Now, OpenET has certainly been developed with irrigated agriculture in mind but it also has applications beyond irrigated agriculture. So I want to um, introduce uh, L.V. Barton. Uh, L.V. works with the Salt River Project and is a forest, uh, helps to uh, guide their forest management. And first we have a video that describes a little bit about uh, the setting where L.V. works. We are in the East Clear Creek watershed. This is one of our uh, most at risk watersheds because our dam here is completely surrounded by Ponderosa pine forest that are in an unhealthy state. With increasing temperatures, we're having increasing variability with droughts and unhealthy forest has fuel for large catastrophic wildfires. So we adopted a 2035 bull to support 500,000 acres of forest thinning. Now this is unprecedented since no utility in the United States has taken on a forest health goal. It's gonna take a lot of science and tech and data. And so when we begin our forest thinning projects, the trees will become more drought tolerant. Open ET will help us have data to inform how our forest thinning projects are reacting to those climate change impacts that we're seeing today. LV, the uh, Salt River Project provides water and energy to two and a half million people in the greater Phoenix metropolitan area in Arizona. Now, I was wondering if you could drill down a little bit and tell us a little bit about how, how OpenET is helping you understand the connections between forest health and how you are using this data. Thank you, Maurice. And thank you everyone for being here in person and online. So as Maurice mentioned, I work for the Salt River Project, which is a U.S. Bureau of Reclamation project. Our organization manages and operates seven dams and reservoirs and delivers water to 2.5 million residents. Now, the water that we deliver every day derives from an 8.3 million acres on three different watersheds. And those watersheds are at, at high risk for catastrophic wildfire due to um, lack of management of our forest and overgrowth. So SRP, my organization, is engaged with a lot of partners to reduce the, the dense material in our forest through forest thinning projects. And by redu reducing the dense vegetation, uh, you also reduce the risk of catastrophic wildfire and the potential impacts that it not only has on our water supplies, the water quality, but also the water infrastructure that we use to deliver the water. Now, one of the questions I always get asked about forest management projects is, can you quantify the water benefits associated with forest thinning projects? 
And now with OpenET, we can. So we know that OpenET has the, the view data for the Western United States, and you can zoom in to any location. And the first place I look at is the projects that we are planning on operating on. This gives us at least the baseline conditions related to evapotranspiration that we can measure on the ground. The second way I use the open ET is that when projects are actually implemented on the ground, we can now compare the thinned version of the force to its previous existing conditions. And you can measure the amount of ET change that has happened between the baseline conditions and the treated conditions. And then the third way that I use open ET data is that now I can monitor over long term. I can look from year to year and look at the ET changes that have occurred over those years. I can also look at how the vegetation is regrowing and how that also impacts the changes in evapotranspiration. So now that I have those three different ways of using open ET data, I also have a way to quantify how my force treatments are going to be impacting the water budget, which really is very helpful for not only regulatory agencies, but when we are also working with our partners and applying for grants, I now have a tool that I can use that actually measures quantified water benefits and not just making assumptions and guesses at what the water benefits really are. So this has been a really life-changing um, definite tool in order for us to look at landscape scale restoration and how it does impact the different water budgets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elvie, and I, I'm, convinced that your experiences there in the forest of Northern Arizona are gonna be valuable in other places and across the world. After living through fires and smoke in New Mexico this year, I'm especially attuned to the issues of forest management and the, and the new challenges that uh, climate change is, is forcing us to deal with there. Now, we are mostly have been working in the United States, but we are certainly beginning uh, to explore what uh, open ET might provide in other places. And uh, beginning that exploration, uh, I want to show, uh, want to introduce Anderson Ruhoff. Now, Anderson has actually been a very important member of our technical team, even though he sits in Brazil. He, he and his team have been instrumental in programming one of the, one of the algorithms, one of the ET estimation methods into the platform. And I know Anderson is also interested in applying open ET uh, in Brazil. And so Anderson, uh, thank you for all your support and your help. And I would be love for you to tell us a little bit about uh, how your interest in expanding open ET and how you see it being used in Brazil. Morning. Uh, thanks for the introdu introduction, Maurice. Uh, it's um, honored to be here. And as Maurice told, I'm from Brazil. In 2019, I was I was in in the U.S. and I I had opportunity to to meet Gabriel, Robin, Maurice, and other OpenIT members. And since then, I'm working with them uh, to to program the some of, some of the models. And uh, so they are using in the U.S. But uh, we are also using the uh, some of the models in Brazil. So uh, Brazil, uh, as you know, is uh, one of the largest uh, crop producer producers in the world. Uh, is investing a lot uh, in technology to, to increase productivity. And there is a lot of efforts as well from the Brazilian Water Agency to, to monitor agriculture. But uh, there, are, there are also several issues. And uh, one of the issues is that uh, agriculture and uh, cropland is uh, expanding uh, towards the, the Amazon. And uh, it's causing some uh, changes, changes in a uh, hydrological cycle, as you know. so. Uh, large parts of, of Brazil have uh, four, five, six months of uh, a dry season, so it's a less reduced, uh, it's, a, it's a reduced precipitation rates, and basically there are uh, large areas in Brazil with irrigation, and basically when, when the cropland expands towards the, the rainforest or or when deforestation happens, what is uh, basically happening is that uh, the that we see some changes in uh, evapotranspiration rates. Basically, uh, it reduces around one to 1.5 millimeter per day during the dry season. 
it, it may doesn't uh, isn't that much one millimeter, but if you if you accumulate uh, this amount over millions of uh, square kilometers and uh, during six months, for instance, it is a lot, and uh, it it's causing some uh, reduction in water availability, water precipitation that is affected not only the cropland areas but also large areas in the country that produces uh, energy based on uh, hydropower and uh, urban supply and uh, in addition we are also seeing um, drought occurrences and uh, drought intensification in brazil even with uh, vast reserves of fresh water so basically we are using open uh, models to to track uh, the impacts of deforestation uh, on the the water cycle and uh, of course to to monitor uh, water use in in agriculture and uh, Open ET data is not uh, only needed in the US, but uh, also abroad in, in countries where we see uh, cropland expansion and deforestation. And it's a great tool to, to get a sense or to monitor uh, how, uh, how the hydrological cycle is evolving. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Anderson, and thank you all the panelists. Uh, it is inspiring to hear your stories and it's very exciting to see the merger of a technology building on the work of decades of hundreds, if not thousands of people and satellite imagery processing, but bringing that to the ground and in, in special places to solve the unique local issues. So with that, we have uh, the rest of the time allotted to questions and answers. And so we will take questions from the audience here and online. If you are online, you can enter your questions in the chat on the, on the uh, uh, global, global pl uh, the, uh, platform. I've got a word here that I can't read that I wrote down, but in, in the digital platform, and uh, we will be monitoring that. And uh, I think we have a, one questioner who's already established uh, her position in the in the line. So, uh, so th thank you all for the panel. I'm Tanya Trujillo from the Department of the Interior in the U.S., and I really did appreciate all of the case studies. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you for highlighting the drought issues that we are dealing with, not only in the Colorado River Basin, which are severe, but also in California, Oregon, New Mexico, uh, all around the rest right now is a huge challenge for us. My question is relating to the uh, satellite data. And I'm wondering if the USGS folks and the NASA folks can tell us, is this from the Landsat program? And uh, even if it is or isn't, I wanted to just uh, say congratulations to the Landsat program, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary of partnership between NASA and USGS. And it's great to have that coordination and the Earth observation images that the program provides. So thank you all. Yes, thank you for the question. I did want to emphasize that it's a kind of a unique opportunity to have the technical, some of the technical team and the users in the room. And so questions of, of any of that nature are, are very much welcome. So uh, yeah, Dr. Sinek. I can quickly address that. Actually, it wasn't my slide. I just forgot to mention it, but it's um, a USGS uh, Landsat. It's a USGS NASA partnership, of course, but also we use other satellites from European satellites like and also in, in partnership with Japanese. But the workhorse is Landsat because it has a unique um, band. The thermal band is only available with Landsat at a field scale. But also we use other satellites, also weather data sets coming from other sources. Landsat, 50 years. Thank you. I'll do that here. Um, thank you very much. No, very, very interesting session. Um, Katrin Ehlert, uh, World Meteorological Organization. I just have a follow-up question to this, like given that the satellites you use, how far does the data go back? And are you planning on integrating this also in forming the US drought monitor or yeah, any any thoughts about that? Thanks. Gabriel Alberto, either of you want to respond to that? Or... Uh, 
So currently we have six years of data, but because we use Landsat, we can go back to 1985 potentially if there's. Anderson, you you have something you want to respond? Yeah, uh, and I would also add that uh, so for deforestation, we are using Landsat data since 1985. So the 50 years of Landsat are unbelievable, good to, to monitor that. Yeah. <laughs> there was another part of your question. Yeah. Right, there are other actual products uh, because Landsat is a little bit expensive to process for the whole corners of for the world. But there are other products like modest based products that are available and the dot monitor has access to them. Some of the products actually like quick dry comes out of the USGS Eros as well. So there are a lot of some satellite products that are being incorporated with a drought monitor. But Landsat is going to take a little bit of a while because just competition is a little bit expensive. Here you go. Online, I'm just going to give them a chance to. Um, there's actually a couple questions about geography. Has this is OpenET available outside of the US? Is it available in African countries? So I think we should just clarify geography really quick. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah. Yeah, so quick answer is it's currently just in the 17 Western states. Um, we certainly see value and it's showing up in other places. And of course, we already have partners on the team who who'd like to see it in their own home countries. Um, we did just launch last October. And so I will say that right now we're really focused on maintaining reliability, providing user support, making sure that we do our homework and our due diligence in the geography where we just made it available. Um, and, you know, we're, we're capacity limited, um, but that doesn't, that doesn't reduce our interests. And I think when a key component of international expansion eventually is going to be, you know, identifying the, the right partners in any region into which OpenET is expanding into, um, that can take a leadership role in sort of identifying the right technical team to partner with there, scoping out and sort of um, doing a landscape analysis, initial steps, building partnerships, et cetera. Um, so I think that's, that's going to be a key first step in any place of interest um, that wants to see OpenET expanded. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now and happy to pass back that way. Oh, um, yeah, just adding a little bit to that. I think from the very beginning, as we began to build OpenET, a real focus was uh, focusing on the end users and the needs and making sure that the platform, the, both the way it, the, the data is pre provided and the interface worked for the people who are going to be needing it. And so for other areas, we're very much interested in learning about people and users who will need this data, how they see it being used, and we can begin building those relationships and building the capacity to potentially expand the, the platform. Functionally, the platform is, is very much applicable in other parts of the world. There are some limitations, some significant limitations. Uh, cloud cover and, ex and extended cloud cover is one of the sort of notable limitations. Also, ground-based uh, meteorological data will be needed, ideally, uh, you know, automatically uh, accessible. Um, uh, meteorological data is an important component of making, making those estimates, uh, drawing down the accuracy, uh, or narrowing down the accuracy bands on those estimates. So, uh, for those who see needs, uh, very interested in hearing about uh, what, how you see it being used potentially in your, in your region. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. My name is Ntai Alamayo. Uh, I really thank the panelists. That was really excellent and insightful. Um, yeah, is it working? Uh, it's, it's, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is really excellent. I mean, Mark, uh, you, we kind of talk the same language. I have developed alpha alpha suitability mapping for Ethiopia, basically to assess where you can grow alpha alpha, how climate change actually affect the production. And also I, I try to see the supplementary irrigation requirements if there is no rainfall. So, um, so since you are representing a farmer organization, 
you know, how would be uh, the uptake rates from a farmer who are not really educated? So that's one question. Uh, the second thing also, I just want to really thank the USGS team, Gabriel and his team. We're actually upscaling the same technology. We have received the open source code to replicate this in Ethiopia as a part of the Africa. So this is really great, great opportunity. And of course, we do also have our partner like NCTS, we're also trying to scale up how we could also you know, integrate from the community use perspective. And also we had some kind of conversation with myself and Tess from the foundation, how community of practice could actually engage because when you are dealing with small scale farmer, they also have a traditional way of controlling, you know, using resource management, special on the water. So we're also trying to integrate that. Hopefully on the next year, WWW, we will be sitting there and also sharing our experience. But uh, yeah, this is really excellent. And uh, thank you for the USGS team. They have been really, really great in terms of sharing the knowledge they have really acquired. Uh, yeah, happy also to engage one-on-one, -on -one, Mark, after, after what? Thanks. It's great to hear one of our major hopes is happening and the, the news and the information is getting around the world. Mark, did you want to respond to his question? The, the, the question was, how do we get farmers and ranchers to actually implement and use it? Yeah. Um, first of all, we're going to be down at the open ET booth after this. We have a break. Come on down. We'd love to talk to you or even go out for coffee to have a conversation later. Um, great question. So I don't, I have a lot of grace with my farmers and ranchers because I am a farmer and rancher, but we all know in this room, he's like, probably like we're water nerds. Uh, things are changing. We're going to have to change with practice. So like I said, we need to make sure they're comfortable with the information make sure they can ground truth it. But reality says is we're gonna have to do more with less. And we're gonna have to push our farmers and ranchers with grace to get there. It's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be difficult, honestly. Uh, we'll sit down and have more conversations, but uh, we gotta figure out how to do more with less. Seen your hand a few times. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. My name is Natalia, I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow. And my question is how this technology can be used to assess cover crops. Um, there are ones like purslane, which are really quite waxy. They're eaten in the Mediterranean and they can help retain soil moisture. So uh, is it already being used in this way? Um, and how are uh, cover crops usually considered by farmers? How would the technology help them consider them? And again, look up purslane. It's really, really cool. Like I don't, work in anything related to developing this, but I'm just a bit of a nerd and I grew up in the Mediterranean originally, so. Thank you. Either of you want to address that? Did you say you don't? Well, no, I mean, <laughs> I, I don't know if this is, I don't know if this is exactly what you're looking for. We, I mean, we cultivate pears, right? That's our target crop, but purslane actually grows in the rows in between the pairs. The nice thing about this is this technology is it's getting uh, data, that raster view that they showed you there, that's a uh, 30 by 30 meter pixel, it's a quarter of an acre. So it's it's encompassing all that evaporative transpiration, all that vegetative growth in that that area. So yeah, those those things are being captured. And, and when we talk about water rights, which Maurice promised to stop me if I use the word res judicata or collateral estoppel or anything like that but uh no um when we talk about water rights yeah you're you're entitled or your your entitlement it encompasses everything within the four corners of your property so yeah we want to try and capture all the water that's being used uh and this technology does that i, I can add just one thing you know uh, the method doesn't require knowledge about the crop the plant it's it doesn't care about that. So it, as long as it uses water. So the most important, if you use water, there will be a satellite signal knowing how much water is being used. And then as, again, put that in the equation. So no need to know what kind of crop or plant is growing, but whether it's used water or not is the most important thing. I Thank you for that presentation. Really, really exciting. I'm Veena Srinivasan. I work in India. We've been, we have a similar product called the Jaltol plugin, which we've been trying to do what you've been doing much more effectively. Where, what, where we've struggled is two things. One is 
uh, we don't have as much flux to our data. In fact, none in the public domain, which is one big problem. But the second problem is uncertainty. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the uncertainty bars, because in the absence of good public data, the bars are sometimes greater than than the total runoff or or, or 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 the total amount of change that farmers can make. And so one of the big struggles with us wrestling with the ETBs is just to try and get the water balances to close, which they often don't. Since you've tried to go to other low data environments, I was wondering if you could speak about uncertainty and what could be done to reduce that. I'd also like to say we'd love to partner. We've got the user and use case side of it figured out. We've just not got the technical side of it figured out. <laughs> And before we can add to that or anybody. So yeah, the, there is always uncertainty. So it's a model, it's an estimate. And that varies depending on whether it's a, the area is using more water, then the uncertainty is lower. But if it's just sparsely vegetated and it's using not, not using much water, then the uncertainty is higher. So in over-irrigated areas, the uncertainty is very low. So it's very accurate. But low vegetation areas, because the amount of water being used is already low, so the relative you know, accuracy is lower. But overall, we're interested in monitoring irrigated lands, and they probably the accuracy is greater than 80%. So we're talking about you know, an accuracy 80 to 90% at a seasonal scale you know, over irrigated agriculture, which is pretty good compared to you know, what we had in the past, plus or minus 50% before. Now we're plus or minus 20, 15%. Anybody understand here? Uh, and uh, one interesting point is when you use uh, one or more models, like three, four, or six models as OpenET, you can uh, also have a sense of the uncertainty. And so you can see in the, in the shaded areas uh, uh, how good is, is your data. And uh, what we are seeing is basically when, we, when you combine more models, so you reduce uncertainty, it's you using an average or some other kind of uh, model combination, it uh, usually uh, produces better, uh, better uh, quality of data. And uh, I, I, I also suppose that your situation in India is quite similar as in Brazil. So we don't have like a 200 flux towers in Brazil, but we have a 35, around 45. It's not uh, publicly available, but uh, it's basically uh, it's building a network with with uh, other researchers, and that's the beauty of OpenIT create connections and uh, put all uh, research scientists, uh, water users, policymakers uh, together to to to, to produce uh, better data. little bit off topic slightly, but I think it's an interesting question. Someone is asking, do you see the tool of OpenET in an extension to also inform temporal spatial carbon sequestration? So I don't know. Uh, I suppose it is possible. So it's not the goal of the open ET and, uh, uh, but uh, so when uh, plants use uh, water or release water to the atmosphere, they also are uh, uh, kept, uh, capturing CO2. So I think if you add some, some other models, I think it would be possible, but uh, it's not, not a goal for the open ET now, but I would say with more modeling, it, it would be. I'm sure I'm missing some. Thank you very much. Very interesting. I have two questions. One is when I hear that you have 4,000 acres, big farms, uh, what's the minimum size of the plot you can manage? Is it something that we can imagine to use for small scale farmers? And the second question is again for Mr. Owens uh, on Oregon. Did you consider looking at the rainfall and the evapotranspiration, because now that you have a very precise evapotranspiration, you can also see how much rain was falling there. And if there's more rain than evapotranspiration, you have recharge of the aquifer at that place. And that's places where you may uh, wish to change the agricultural method because you could increase the uh, uh, recharge of the aquifer. Either of you want 
to respond, I can. Yeah, I mean, so it's a 30 meter pixel. So it depends on the satellite data. So really the, our accuracy, the spatial accuracy depends on what satellite you use. So with Landsat being, you know, a field scale, so we will be able to monitor about a couple of acres. So it's, you know, the total maybe thousands of acres we are monitoring extend, but if you're interested in an individual, we can say an acre, but I would say if a couple of acres to three acres, we will be able to monitor that. If you use other satellites and they will become a little bit coarser, but with Landsat, it's about a couple of acres. Yeah. It's also about practicality. So if you're on a farmer, you're going to look at the scale of what that irrigation system does, what that circle, what that linear, what that wheel line does. And we talked about the 30 by 30 meter, quarter meter, but it's honestly for practicality. If I have one pivot, I'm going to manage that system as a whole. If I have a 40 acre irrigation system, I'm going to manage that. So it's going to go down to what the farmer can do and what he can manage and how he applies water with the scale. And just to responding to the last part of your question on the water balance, groundwater recharge and such, one of the one of the big questions that I hope to get a better sense of is how much water that is applied through irrigation is actually recharging the groundwater. Open ET doesn't give you that number, but previously we were guessing at all those numbers. Open ET does provide a good estimate of the ET, and it gives you that that piece of the puzzle and allows better estimation of the amount of water that is then recharging groundwater or going to going off site to somewhere else. And so it does help to narrow that analysis. One more. So knowing we're all water nerds, but open ET, when I look at that and I look at my pivot and it shows me what open ET is, that doesn't mean that's the amount of water I'm actually applying. So like when I talked about when we get together on those Monday mornings, we look at what the crop demand is, which should be correlating with open ET, but then I take the efficiency of my irrigation system and I have to multiply it by that to understand what I need to apply. So the way we saved water on a project was putting more efficient systems in, and they were normally designed at approximately a normal MESA, mid elevation spray application on a pivot in our area is designed at about 7.2 gallons per acre per minute per day. We took it down to where we designed our system down to about 6.2 gallons per minute. We tried 5.8, but we started getting a reduction of yield. Yes, eventually we're going to have to irrigate to reduction of yield, but that's the type of information we're looking at when we try to design to. I'll go, back, go to the back uh, a little bit since I've been focusing on the front. Good morning. I'm Zane Marshall, Director of Water Resources for the Southern Nevada Water Authority in Las Vegas. Um, we've been supportive of Open ET, and uh, uh, our congressional representatives have as well. I'm curious what the status of uh, funding is for the program, and is the program um, at full uh, implementation or development for the current uh, the current scope? And what is your needs for funding or other resources going forward? Very much like that question. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so we, Open ET is, is now establishing itself as a new nonprofit. Um, so it went from a, a project that was primarily philanthropically funded with a lot of support also from federal agencies um, to, to an independent entity that is now seeking a variety of funding sources, some of which is um, public and then also looking to offset any gaps in the public picture with some philanthropic dollars as well. Um, the federal, our, our attempts at federal authorization are still in the works. We haven't seen that. We've seen a bill pass the House, but not the Senate at this point. Um, and so, you know, it's unclear how that's going to play out over the next couple of months and, and through the election cycle. Um, and so we're at this point seeing a, a healthy amount of support from states, um, not as much yet from the federal government. And, and we also got some good transition funding from some philanthropic sources. I would say we are fully funded for our current scope through uh, the end of a year and then really needing some additional sources of funding to keep going um, into the next, next couple of years. Um, and one thing that we're really, as I mentioned earlier, with regards to the international question focused on is being sure that 
when others hear these stories and momentum starts to build around applications for this tool, that we have the team capacity to respond to that and to provide the levels of user support and partnership that are needed in order to make sure this tool is getting used and that scaling starts to actually happen. So there's that aspect, there's making sure that the science continues to evolve and this continues to represent best available science in terms of the integrity of the data that's being put out there, that the ground truthing efforts can continue to happen so that we build the trust that we need in all those communities. So there's a, there's a lot of work still to do, even though the tool has been launched, um, even in the 17 Western states that it's currently sitting in. So really appreciate the question. I hope we're successful um, in, in this fundraising effort of ours because there's a lot of good a lot of good that can come from it. So, thanks. And I, I will add a little bit to that. I was in my closing. I, I would plan to acknowledge the incredible generosity of a number of funders. We have oh, we have supported, been supported over the past seven years by a group of foundations that have contributed uh, to the tune of nine to ten million dollars, according to how you count it, to support the team in the building of the platform. That, of course, builds on billions of dollars of investment by the U.S. federal government and other entities in research, uh, getting to the point where we can actually program these algorithms and have confidence in them, uh, but very much want to thank those partners for support. To the point of going forward, we are uh, we're a nonprofit venture. We intend to, we hope to fund OpenET, uh, the, the basic functionality of OpenET in a way that continues to provide the data to individual users and small users free of charge. Uh, at some point, there could be a, pro, a, a, a volume point where we begin to charge uh, for, some of the, for some of the data, for large volumes of data. Uh, but it's a nonprofit venture. Our intent is to provide open e ET information to users of all types so that we're all looking at the same data, solving water issues. And to do that, we're certainly going to need funding. Uh, we have uh, funding for the immediate future, but frankly, only a few months out, we begin to, we begin to see question marks and uh, very much looking to fill those gaps with state and federal funding to some extent, but uh, also looking for other uh, funding sources. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Callie Stinson. I'm here with Water Foundry, which is a consultancy specializing in strategy and, and technology innovation. Um, first of all, thank you for an outstanding panel and congratulations to the organizers. This is really not only interesting, but I think um, a breath of fresh air in terms of perspective. So well done on that. My question is about um, partnerships. In particular, technology partnerships. Um, you know, this is a, a relatively new endeavor. It's very exciting. Um, it's an impressive tool. We also know that this is an increasingly crowded landscape. And I'm curious how you're thinking about collaboration opportunities um, with other, whether it be tools or other technology providers, to help kind of amplify the impact of your solution and reach more people. I'm sure many of us have comments to make on that. I'll, I'll start a little in, and have uh, Robin add and, and others on the team can add to that. But uh, it has been an amazing and exceptionally challenging uh, partnership and collaboration in, in getting to this point. The issues surrounding intellectual property, uh, ownership of the, of the software, uh, contrib contributions of software from different sources, that in itself is a is a whole arena that uh, water wonks like me are not so familiar with, but are quickly having to get up to speed with and and hire the right expertise to support that. Um, but um, uh, an, another issue that that is is frankly quite challenging is the demand for good uh, good software applicator application uh, talent, and we have just some some amazing talent on the team uh, and uh, they uh, are are doing great work they believe in their work they also have lots of lots of job opportunities and so keeping that team together and keeping that expertise is is a, a continuing challenge and something that certainly weighs heavily on my mind I'll, I'll pass it to Robin yeah I just wanted to um that was 
a good a good view on the internal aspect of that. I think um, I wanted to be sure that that we said again or had that chance to say again the point that I think Alberto made about the development of the application programming interface because the whole you know drive behind that was to make sure that OpenET was not just something that individuals could go look at and explore, but that other tools could link into um, and then build from, right? And so we have a, we haven't yet publicly released it, but we do have a working group of API users and they've been, they range from consultants to state agency staff to ag tech firms, and they've all been testing that API and providing feedback. And at the same time, you know, starting to build some momentum around integration into irrigation farm and ranch management tools, for example, um, other like other water accounting systems um, is another use case that we didn't actually talk about today, but uh, that's been integrated into programs like that for um, water management districts across California and elsewhere. And so it's certainly um, another really big thrust of ours is to make sure that, you know, people can continue to innovate on top of what we've built here and that other software programs and other tools can be built on top of it. Um, and that's part of the support that I was speaking to, wanting to be sure that we have, you know, funding to support that team to continue to partner with those consultants and others that are using the tool and building from it. Um, and the the API we've heard, I just have to give credit to Alberto and Will and others who aren't here. A lot of folks in that API user group have really complimented them on what an efficient and amazing um, backend they've built into that and how easy it is to use and integrate. So um, compliments to that part of the team. I think we have time for one more question. And uh, I don't really know how to be fair. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Imran Sajid, and I'm a consultant uh, for water management in South and Central Asia, and also a fresh PhD graduate from Bonn University. So my question is that, uh, do you have plan in future to expand this platform beyond ET for water accounting or agriculture water management? Because yeah, I completely agree with you, with you that ET is the core component of water balance in agriculture. So once we, and it's really easy to estimate other components like potential ev evapotranspiration, percolation, runoff, and other components. So is there any plan to go beyond this in future? And also which method do you use to estimate ET? Is it surface energy balance or do you use other methods as well? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for that question. I'll provide a brief early answer and then uh, Gabriel or others can respond to the, to the methods. Um, so currently the ET is provided wall to wall all of the land surface estimates are provided. So that's forest lands, range lands. Uh, the estimates aren't very good in urban areas where there are a lot of other heat sources, a lot of extraneous heat sources. And so that becomes complicated in urban areas. But for rural areas, uh, forest management and, and uh, rangeland management are certainly part of the capability of OpenET. The science behind that and the accuracy assessments aren't quite as well developed as they are for irrigated agriculture, but we anticipate a lot of work to be happen on that quite rapidly now that OpenET is there and provides that data to other researchers who can, who can begin to narrow down those uh, accuracy bands in those landscapes. Geographically speaking, we are beginning some work to expand to some other parts of the United States and to extreme Northwestern Mexico, we have some funding uh, to support that expansion. We do, as Robin indicated, uh, we're, we're excited about expanding into other parts of the, of the world, supporting, in fact, supporting others uh, to build on the basic platform and engaging expertise from other places to do that. Uh, we will have to secure the funding and have the support to do that, but, but very much look forward to do that in, in the coming years. I'll pass it to Gabriel to speak to the methodologies, but also in case you were asking about other variables being available through the platform, um, NDVI is already there. Uh, and we also have potential ET available as well. So if you're wanting to understand, you know, changes in ET that are from weather as opposed to land use practices, you can do that by looking at the ratio between potential and actual ET. Um, we are working on adding effective precipitation, although I hesitate to put any kind of timeline on that because it's a really tough nut to crack as far as I understand. Um, but 
not yet having plans around, you know, recharge or, or other aspects of the water budget being added in, really focusing on getting the ET piece right and adding the other data around that to help folks understand um, the, the consumptive use of applied water, right? So that's why we're wanting to be able to add an effective precip. Um, and then I'll let you speak. So, so uh, we have six models and four of them are fully pretty much energy balance. And two of them are using the um, NDVI based or a kind of a combination of NDVI and thermal. So, but mainly because of the, you know, just the thermal data and the sensitivity of the thermal data to water use, we're using a surface energy balance. So I think I can add also whether this water counting, I think Anderson was telling me how he's using ET and combined with precipitation data, which is globally available now, how people are planning to build water accounting for larger basins once we have the different components, if you want to say something about that, but uh, other, yeah, okay, yeah, but yeah, the data is available. So we are at time. I do want to emphasize, as Mark indicated earlier, we do have a booth that is uh, diagonally across, kind of in the middle of the building on the far on the far wall, and a number of us will be moving over there after this. Expect. What's that? It's right here on this floor, I think. We'll be moving over there and we'll be there. Uh, different ones of us will be there through the week. So very much welcome you coming over either now to have some further conversations or, or, or during the week. Um, most importantly, encourage you to log into openetdata.org, establish your own account and look at the data. Uh, it is amazing technology and frankly, amazing artwork. Uh, the people who built this interface did an amazing job making it easy and smooth and, uh, and, and then behind that, an incredibly fast functioning uh, interface. And if you're like me and you've been just dying for this data for years and years, you will lose yourself in exploring what evapotranspiration is across a landscape finding unique unique situations and uh, improving your understanding of what's happening at a landscape scale. Uh, it's, it's a real treat. Thank you so much for your attention here today. Thanks for your interest and we look forward to expanding our community uh, around uh, ET data and helping to address the challenges uh, that uh, we all face around the world in water scarcity. Thank you very much. <laughs>